As a heads up, throughout today's episode, you will hear a second voice helping to narrate the story. This is a voice dramatization of a victim's writings from her public Facebook posts. You'll know it when you hear it. There are nearly 20,000 murders annually in the United States. Perhaps it's the weather, but the Pacific Northwest has become the notorious home of serial killers and bizarre crimes. We're here to discuss those murders, to try to understand the motives, respect and remember the victims, and explore the humanity of it all. I'm Emily Rowney. And I'm Alicia Holland. And And this this is Murder Murder in the the Rain. Rain. As kids, we're taught to trust people in authority, teachers, firemen, police officers, our parents. But what happens when people leverage that trust to do terrible things? Today's case is about a man who exploited the trust between a civilian and a civil servant, a man who went on a rampage through two states, a rampage filled with kidnapping, grand theft auto, and aggravated murder. Ooh. 19-year-old Salem, Oregon resident Andrea Mays got off her double shift at Ross on the evening of Monday, July 25, 2016. Before heading home, she paused in her car to do a very normal thing for a teenager, take a selfie. She posted her pic to Snapchat, belted in, and was about to back up when a man came into view. This man stuck his arm into my barely cracked window, unlocked the door, and got inside the passenger seat. With his backpack hiding his firearm, I was forced at gunpoint and demanded to drive, all while he was telling me how he had just murdered someone. The day before Andrea's frightening interaction, a 23-year-old Bend woman, Kaylee Sawyer, was reported missing. Even at an early age, Kaylee was an avid reader. Kaylee Ann Sawyer and her grandmother read thousands of books together, which Grandma carefully kept in a log. Her friends describe her as happy and outgoing, bubbly and sassy, always smiling, and in the words of one of her friends, a fantastic human being. Kaylee spent her time working at a local dentist office as an assistant, as well as attending Central Oregon Community College, otherwise known as COCC. The night of Saturday, July 23, 2016, Kaylee attended a bachelorette party for her friend Lisa. They spent the evening dancing and drinking with colleagues and friends. A mutual friend of her and her boyfriend's happened to be at the same bar. This friend texted her boyfriend, Cam, that she was dancing with another guy and that he should absolutely come and pick her up. Cam drove to pick up Kaylee and they headed home to their shared apartment in Aubrey Park. This sat directly side by side to COCC. During the ride home, they got into an argument about the events that evening. When they parked, Cam got out and he basically told Kaylee, you should just stay in the car until you'll cool down and then you can come inside. But it's speculated that she went on a walk to cool down instead. This is a behavior that her mother said is very familiar, that every time Kaylee would get upset when she was growing up, she would sneak out her window and go on a walk and then come home after she'd cooled off. So it's not unusual, but keep in mind, this is in the very early hours of Sunday, July 24th. Not the safest time for a stroll being a 23-year-old girl at night. And the big difference this time was Kaylee never came home. Cam spent hours calling and texting friends trying to locate Kaylee. He thought her mother would know where she was. However, her mom had been on a camping trip that weekend in a location that has no cell phone service. For those of you that don't know Bend, Oregon, this area is referred to as the high desert. And in order to get there from the west, you have to drive through the Cascade Mountain Range. And there's a good 40 minutes where I never have cell phone service. Mm -hmm. Right? No and music, no nothing. Nothing. That area is lovely for camping, hiking, kayaking. So that's where people typically are going. And that's where her mother had been. So it wasn't until later in the day on Sunday when Julie Van Cleve, Kaylee's mom, received all of the frantic messages in the mobile phone dump that your phone will do once you get out of the mountains. After speaking with Julie, Cam called 911 to report Kaylee missing. Dispatch, how can I help you? Hi. Last night, I got home from the bars with my girlfriend, and she got upset at me and ran off. Mm-hmm. And I still haven't heard from her. Her phone's off. Okay, so did she just take up walking or something from the address? Like, she was mad? Yeah, I walked. She was, yeah, she was mad at me, so I walked inside and told her to come meet me in there when she's, like, calm down. And then I went back out in 10 minutes, and she was gone. And I called her a few times, and she said she was walking down the street. I haven't heard from her since. 
Julie was worried that Kaylee's disappearance might not be a priority due to her age and the fact that she had fought with her boyfriend, so she decided to also make a call. In her call, she chose to exaggerate a little bit about Kaylee's medical history, citing that she had issues with seizures and hoping that a medical emergency would put an immediate spotlight on her daughter. This seemed to work because the police took her seriously and got the ball rolling. Julie proceeded to recruit friends and family to help search for Kaylee and started posting missing flyers of Kaylee's face on every possible surface in the bend and surrounding areas. One town away in Redmond, Oregon, Isabel Ponce sat patiently waiting in the Redmond Police Department lobby. Isabel was a newly minted police officer and was there to meet with the sergeant for reasons unknown to the other officers in the building. Once the sergeant was available, they moved into an interview room where she tearfully unloaded that a terrible accident had occurred. Isabel explained that her husband told her he had hit someone with his vehicle. Her husband, Edwin Enoch Lara, had been acting strange all day Sunday, starting at church. When she approached him later in the day to ask what was wrong, he explained that while he was on duty at his job as a security guard at COCC, he hit someone with his work vehicle. Mm-hmm and they may be dead. In a complete panic, he then took her gun from her purse and told her he needed to leave town. She said she didn't know where he was, but that she thinks he maybe hit the missing girl from the posters, Kaylee Sawyer. Police were now very concerned as they learned Edwin had possession of a gun and was on the run. And not only had his wife been a police officer, they found out he had a degree in criminal justice, meaning he would be familiar with how law enforcement would approach apprehending him. There was also the fact that Kaylee was still missing and no one had spoken to her since the very early hours of Sunday morning. Police began weighing their options, considering that Kaylee was either dead or dying and was possibly kidnapped. During Isabel's interview, she mentioned to police that Edwin had family in Los Angeles, and that was the only place she could think he would flee to. She said there was nowhere nearby he would go, no friends or family he would hide with, and he very likely fled to California. However, detectives learned that Edwin's parents lived just minutes from their home, and there they found Edwin's car abandoned, the car they were currently on the lookout for. After questioning his parents, who claimed to have little information to lend them, they said he had asked for money, quickly left, taking one of their vehicles with them. So was she covering for him? I don't really know. So, Or did she just not know where her in-laws lived? Let's follow up with this in the end. Okay. Because I have some thoughts on this okay. additionally. So now it's Monday, July 25th. Police are looking for the vehicle they now know Edwin is in and are seeking anything, any clue that they can to locate Kaylee, as well as this person of interest, Edwin Lara. All the while, not knowing that in just mere hours, a girl in Salem will be abducted. Police obtained a warrant to search Edwin Lara's home. The house didn't have many leads. However, in the backyard, there was a smoking gun, or rather, a bag of clues. There in the yard was a shed, and in that shed was a white garbage bag containing everything the police needed to tie Edwin Lara to Kaylee Sawyer. He had her shoes that she had been wearing at the bachelorette party, and her green purse filled with her belongings, a purse that was now covered in bloodstains. Worse yet, inside the purse was a large, bloody rock a rock that was potentially a murder weapon. They now shifted their investigation from a missing person and or kidnapping victim to be a possible homicide investigation. Why, why keep the rock? You know, it's like you're, you're out in the desert. There are lots of rocks. <laughs> That's exactly what I was thinking. I'm like, just throw it I mean, somewhere. I want them to get caught, but like a little splash of water and a toss and... Agreed. Well, he's obviously not smart anyway, but... A few hours and 130 miles away, Andrea is being forced to drive her car out of town with an unfamiliar man. I began driving south, just as I was told, but my car was on E at this point, so he had me pull off onto an exit in South Salem, constantly being reminded very thoroughly not to make eye contact with anyone, or else, according to him, they will die because of you. I will shoot them. I couldn't. I tried everything I could to just get him to leave me alone. Tried to give him my car, even though I had told him from the beginning it wouldn't make it far. It was leaking oil like crazy. 
but nothing seemed to matter to him. He needed a hostage. He finally told me he needed to get to California. My stomach dropped and so much fear came over me. I began crying hysterically and begging him just to take my car and let me go. After passing Eugene, I was apparently driving too fast, so he had me pull into a rest area to switch seats. Handcuff me to my gear shifter, I had to hop over to the other side of the seat. After a while, he uncuffed me, and eventually, just as I suspected, my car started acting up. It needed more oil. I found another exit and another gas station, this time forced me to get off with him. I was forced to pretend to be his girlfriend or else, just like he said earlier, he threatened to kill anyone I looked at. I was so angry, screaming inside for someone to notice me, but no one did. They continued to California. As the sun came up on Tuesday, July 26, Andrea's car started to show significant signs that it wouldn't make it much further. Edward decided that it was time to get a new car. He pulled off in Wairica, California at the Super 8 Hotel. There was a man, unfortunately, just walking into his room when Edwin burst in with a gun in one hand and Andrea in the other and demanded the man's car. When the man refused, he was shot. Next thing I knew, we were standing in the motel room, gun pointed at a victim who couldn't stop yelling. And then the gun goes off. My ears were ringing and everything sort of went black. While the police responded to reports of a man shot in the stomach at a Wairika motel, Edwin dragged Andrea with him to a nearby gas station to locate another car. At the gas station, there was a family with a newly full tank of gas. A man stood at the pump while his elderly mother and his two sons sat in the car. Edwin pointed the gun at them, forcing one of the young men to drive while he and his hostage climbed inside. They took off with the family, leaving the man alone at the pump. Five minutes after responding to the shooting, there was now a 911 call from a man reporting that his car had been taken and three of his family members were still inside. As they sped off in the stolen car, Edwin forced the family to hand over all their cell phones and told Andrea to throw them out the window and onto the highway. Once at a Wairica, Edwin surprisingly pulled over and let the family out at a rest stop in Weed, California. Not Andrea, though. Her he wanted to keep. We didn't get too far before the boy asked if he could be dropped off on the side of the road. To my surprise, this animal agreed. I thought, finally, I'm free. Pulled over and I got out, but he turned to me and told me to get in the passenger seat. I kept crying and asking why, but he still needed a hostage. Andrea mentions in an interview with Dateline that as the family exited the car, she saw one of the young men with a phone he had managed to keep. Maybe this gave her hope. Hope that they would be found quickly. Hope that she would be found quickly. They continued down the I-5, but it wasn't long before Edwin started ranting about being followed by police and by helicopters. While in the last few moments of his rampage and his life as a free man, Edwin took Andrea's phone to make calls to his family and to record what happened in his own words, all while speeding down the freeway. Hi, everybody. Um, I just want to say that I apologize for everything I've done. Most likely I'm going to get caught. And um, sorry about that girl. About that girl in Central Oregon. And I just want to let family members, um, Andrea, that she's fine and she will be fine because uh, so far she's been doing uh, what I've been going to do. You know, and, and if you guys are wondering uh, if I have done dirty things to her, no. All right, I'm not that kind of guy. You know, I just, you know, I used to kill that other girl, you know, and I regret it. I regret killing her. You know, she kept screaming and I just her forever. So the cops said, not to shoot us, because if they shoot us, then that's not my fault. Okay, but sorry, everybody. Bye. So on the road again, he said he needed to get to L.A. At this point, I thought I was never going home. I'm going to be sold or even worse. I began losing hope. 
Adding to everything, he insisted on making a video on my phone of himself, explaining everything he had done, starting with the beautiful girl from Bend named Kaylee Sawyer. And then he wanted me to post the video to my Facebook with the caption, Murderer on the Loose. I just changed the setting to only me, and he stopped threatening me after he saw that it posted. After some phone calls he made, it was around 6 a.m. now, and we were close to Reading. Going over 100 on the freeway, I thought this was never going to end. But then something changed. Maybe after me constantly telling him to turn himself in, he decided to do just that. Hope sparked in me again. Then I see a police car. I thought, yes, this is over. He called 911 and began telling them everything. But we passed the cop. They didn't follow. A long speed chase later, he pulled over. Why did she change the setting to only her? Like, why wouldn't wouldn't you want any kind of... Uh, no, so she goes into this in detail with her interview with Dateline about not wanting to traumatize her friends and family in church because at this point, they don't know what really happened to her. They She's worried that they're going to see this with this guy in a gun who just killed someone is going to freak them out. So she chose to do that to just not be all over social media. Is that not like, I've just... I don't know. I guess if you're in that moment, but like, sorry if that upsets you, but well, he I didn't need know people, though it works. But I mean, like, I'm sorry, church family, if this bothers you, but like, I need the police to be able to track this guy and to have sure. his face and to have his confession and ha- like, well, in her eyes, sorry, he, everyone else, he was already going to call 911. He'd confessed to everyone he called. So I don't, I don't think she was worried it was going to continue much longer. I think at this point she did see hope. So maybe she just wanted to save it from social media. What a saint. I'd be like, yep, put it, let's go live. (laughs) (laughs) Let's show the the mile marker where we're at. Good grief. And for the record, that wasn't victim blaming. That was me just trying to understand why she changed the setting. That's all. Andrea could now breathe a sigh of relief. Ten hours into her ordeal, police were behind the car handcuffing Edwin. She was safe. She was going home. But then, after Edwin was handcuffed, the police turned to her and arrested her. They definitely did not get the memo that she had been kidnapped and forced to endure hours with her kidnapper. Oh, God. He got out and walked back and was handcuffed. I was flooded with tears, just ready to go home. But then I was handcuffed also. I thought, maybe it's just a formality. The car ride there, the officer let me make phone calls, and then we were at the station. For almost 12 hours, I was there, Robbed of my dignity, treated like a criminal. They said I could see a judge next week. While in custody, Andrea was treated like everyone else. Strip searched, belongings taken, and put into a cell to wait. They didn't call Salem police or anyone to it's be like, bonkers we, can we confirm this? Story? Where was she reading? This was out in California. So the highway patrol is the one that pulls them over. Not everyone is up to date on what's going on. They're not talking to Oregon regularly. But luckily, the detectives from Bend, who had been working on Kaylee's case, were on their way to California. They knew Edwin was in custody, and they were going to come to Andrea's rescue. Detectives were chomping at the bit to talk to Edwin Lara. They wanted to know what happened to Kaylee Sawyer. Initially, Edwin told them the same story he had told his wife, that he accidentally ran over Kaylee while he was on his shift at work. He didn't realize that the detectives searched his home, found the bloody rock among Kaylee's other belongings. Eventually, they were able to get him to tell them everything that happened and to even disclose where her body could be found. Edwin detailed that he was on duty at COCC in his work vehicle when he spotted Kaylee walking through campus. Edwin was donning his work uniform that looked exactly like a police officer uniform, which matched well to his vehicle that said public safety along the side and looked a whole lot like a police cruiser. Yeah, they do. I hate those cars when they're on the freeway. He stopped to ask her if she needed assistance and identified that she was intoxicated. This, I imagine, is when he realized a sick fantasy of his could be played out. He then accused Kaylee of being a prostitute and offered to pay her money for sex. When she said no, he demanded her purse. She began crying as he took her purse and started rummaging through it. He realized her phone was not in her purse, so he demanded that too. She refused to hand it over and started screaming to draw attention to the desolate campus as her reality was beginning to sink in. 
He told her to shut up and began forcing her into the car through the back door. She kicked and hit, so he strangled her until she was unconscious. He then forced her limp body fully into the back seat of the car, which, like a police vehicle, was a cage. He drove her to an isolated parking lot in the back of campus, lot B12. Kaylee started to come to and began thrashing in the back of the vehicle. Edwin once again got in back and strangled her until she was unconscious, but this time it was shorter lived, so he dragged her outside behind the shrubs and hit her in the head with a large rock. She passed out again, and he raped her as she struggled to live, falling in and out of consciousness. After he finished raping her, he found a much larger rock, or what I would describe as a boulder, because he specified that it was about 60 to 70 pounds, and he killed her by smashing her head. He then left her body at the crime scene, dropped her his work vehicle off, and returned with his personal vehicle, picking Kaylee's body up and taking her 20 miles to Redmond, Oregon, where he hid her near Northwest Humboldt's Way and Antler Avenue. The next day, he was concerned that her body was going to be found, so possibly with the help of his cousin, he went back and moved her body, throwing her into a ditch off of Highway 126 west of Redmond. After his admissions, Kaylee's body was located off the old Redmond Highway, where Edwin said it could be found. Police had all the evidence they located at his home, and he made a full confession. They did everything right, reading him his Miranda rights and even the rights from his native Honduras since he held dual citizenship. I don't like that you're prefacing with all that. (laughs) There was one problem. Mm. And this all boils down to semantics. On video in the interrogation, Edwin makes a casual, he says a casual question like, how long till my lawyer's going to be here? And it's kind of dismissed. Oh, so no. when he gets to the full confession, his lawyer is not present. And he requested a lawyer technically. Technically. So a judge eventually ruled it inadmissible, which was going to be a problem because the DA and her family wanted to seek the death penalty, which, of course, requires a trial. After speaking with Kaylee's parents to weigh out their options, everyone agreed that a plea deal was the best plan of action. So since they did have all that evidence, they could very likely get him put away. So he did agree, and they were able to get a life sentence without the worry that a trial they were going to lose because of this technicality. Edwin Enoch Lara received two life sentences with no parole for his rampage across two states. One life sentence for the rape and murder of 23-year-old Kaylee Sawyer and another for the armed kidnapping of 19-year-old Andrea Mays. He lives out the remainder of his sentences in the Snake River Correctional Institution in Ontario, Oregon, and he has no option of ever getting out. He did, of course, leave the court going out with a bang, In typical Oregon fashion, the courtroom was dramatic on all sides. The judge allowed Kaylee's friends and family to speak their piece as Edwin was found guilty and received his sentence. Her grandfather asked the courts to just turn over custody to him so he could go kill him in the desert. A family friend said he would help kill him and he'd let the buzzards pick at his carcass in the desert. And Edwin himself ended the courtroom shenanigans with an over-the-top monologue about how he hopes the Lord would heal the families from all their pain, sounding like a televangelist. And it was so obviously contrived that many of her family members just left right in the middle of it, which is all on video. It's so classic. They just stomp on out. Despite the violence and pain, Kaylee's family has done a lot of work to keep her memory alive so that people remember her for who she is and not what happened to her. First, there's KK's Readers. This is a program um, used to help Head Start students receive books that they might not have access to at home. Oh, nice. So I mentioned earlier that Kaylee's an avid reader. One of the books her and her grandmother loved to read together was Oh, the Places You Will Go by Dr. Seuss. And they've already gathered thousands of copies of this book to be able to give to kids in need. Oh, that's awesome. In addition, you're going to like this one. In addition, Kaylee's father, Jamie Sawyer, has worked tirelessly to get Kaylee's law passed by Congress. So this law mandates steps to ensure that campus security officers and their equipment 
do not resemble law enforcement. Nice. So that the officers cannot act as law enforcement. And that means their vehicles can't have lights on the top like a cop car. They can't have a divider cage where someone could be locked in. We'll post pictures on the website too. It is very much like a cop car. It's very scary. I can't imagine the Especially panic. if you're intoxicated and you're right. like, wait, what's going on? And you think first she probably thought it was a cop there to help right. her. And then she's getting forced in and can't get out. There's no buttons to hit. Right. There's no door no handle. No horn, nothing. Yeah. So they also are requiring that the cars have a GPS system and camera or recorded dispatch system. So that way every call is recorded. Officers are prohibited from making vehicle stops and cannot frisk people. A comprehensive background check and psychological test will now be required, which I'm a little surprised weren't it already wasn't. in place. It wasn't. Yeah, I didn't even realize that campus security could frisk people or stop people. I thought it was literally just like, when we need to call security because some rabble rousers are making some noise. Agreed. Like- Andrea Mays is now back to living a normal life. She, of course, had a lot to work through when she returned home, but eventually she was able to see the positive in the treacherous ordeal she lived through. Now, over two years later, I know who I am. I am not a victim. I am a survivor. I am a warrior. And I'm here to help others by sharing my story. I'm not ashamed. I'm proud of myself. All right. What do you got for me? What kinds of questions? Uh, One, did Kaylee, in fact, have a seizure disorder or was her mom just You know, I think she maybe had had a seizure before. Okay. So in an interview with her mom, she mentioned exaggerating her seizure disorder. So I got the impression she had had one, although I never heard her explicitly say that. Okay. So maybe when she was younger, she had had one incident or something. And And so she's like, guess what? We got a medical. I love that. I think that was really cool of her mom because as a parent, you know, as anybody who watches crime, people don't get attention when you're a grown ass adult and you go missing. Nobody cares. So that was her one way of getting attention on it because she knew her daughter would never do that. Yeah. It's so weird of for the guy did he you know it makes you wonder did he take that job because yeah you know it like got his rocks off being an authoritative figure was this like a long con let's talk about that because there are some theories there so there is a lawsuit pending between kaylee's parents and coCC and in the lawsuit they make a couple of claims that the you know the school's responsible because the vehicle was too much like a cop car right but one of the items is that there are potentially two assaults that that women have claimed and the school just kind of brushed them under the rug and it came out. So I don't know if that's made any progress in court, but I found that to be very interesting because another item that was found on his property in that shed where they found Kaylee's items, there was a poster board from like a school project about serial killers. Mm-hmm. And it, it kind of, they alluded to Edwin being obsessive about serial killers and the notoriety oh. that these murderers get. So I personally it was think kind of brewing. he'd been brewing, yeah, planning it, then saw the opportunity and went for it. And then it's like, did you marry your wife just because she was a cop? Well, she was like, newly a cop. I think they they were both interested in it, and that's how they met. I yikes. I do think he'd been planning this, and that there's a theory that he just desperately wanted to kill a beautiful woman, and the opportunity just walked right in front of his car. Right. Um, Imagine the chutzpah. You're at work. You're in a company car. You are in uniform. You have coworkers that like. There are people around that are going to. It is. But have you ever things. have you like, seen that campus? I have been to Cock Campus. So it's for those of you who haven't. I'll have a map on the website, but it is pretty large and. There's not a whole lot when you get to the parking lot. It's yeah, I'd say like kind of it's woodsy. desolate and yeah. woods, like it's just weird. You almost don't even see the school. You're just like, right. Well, what and it is sounded this? to me like it was two people working, somebody in the office and somebody out in the car and yeah. that he could get away with whatever he wanted because no one's out there with him. Still ballsy. It is. Yeah. But why keep the rock? Like I'm so stuck on I that. I think like, he panicked. I think he panicked and didn't know what he was doing, but he dumped the body and then went back and got it. I think he thought about it for a little while the next day because, let's talk about this, the location where they found her. Edwin tells the detectives in interrogation where they can find him. About the same time, they locate his parents' car that he had abandoned in Salem. Mm -hmm. Inside the car was a note that basically alluded to him killing Kaylee, and it had the number 
18700, which was the mailbox number right near where her body was dumped. 187 is homicide. Yeah. I think he was Did then like, I can be clever. I can be notorious. Uh, yeah, I'm the new Zodiac. Yeah, so then he moved seven. her body. Mm-hmm. Yikes. And then like the wife going in and like, yeah, I think she's I don't know what's going fuck. on. I th- like. So she divorced him. She quit her job and she moved away and nobody knows what's going on, but no charges were ever pressed against her. I think. Well, she yeah, wanted- I can't imagine. But I think like you would be. You wouldn't want to think. Oh, yeah. They've done something. I think she was f- having that internal fight of like, I got to tell the I'm police, a new but cop, I can't I'm believe gonna, you did yeah. this. Yeah, and then it's like, oh, he hit someone with his car, and now he's running away. It's like, honey. Yeah. No. Yeah. No, he didn't. But I mean, at least she went right away instead of like, yes. I'll cover well, for you. Or I'll... not right away. They think she waited until the next day. I mean. Well, that would be a pickle to be in. It would. It's... It would. I think she probably thought about it all evening before uh-huh. making her mind up. Whether yeah. it's worth it to like bust her marriage, but I mean, hello. Yeah. He murdered someone. So there are a couple of disturbing things that came out of this, other than, you know, a violent death of mm-hmm. a young girl. But first, one of the detectives who happened to previously be a pastor, when they went through the house, noticed that it's just like Bibles and everything everywhere. And they located like videos on YouTube of Edwin singing religious songs and love songs. And he also was like an avid 10% tithings giver. So I mean, what, Sounds accurate. what is this with these religious fanatics and murdering young girls? Shame. Same reason senators that work so hard to block, you know, gay rights are then caught uh, in the bathroom. Yes. You know, mm-hmm. it's like, I know, I know bag. how bad it is. So <laughs> they're feeding a paper bag. Feet in a paper bag. You know, you never heard, you never heard that story? What? He, I think he's a senator caught in the bathroom at an airport and he was standing in a paper bag so no one knew what he was doing in the with another guy in the bathroom. So it looks like one guy's standing with a paper bag, but one of the guys is in the paper bag. That's amazing. <laughs> you never heard that? No, I always heard the little like foot tap, you know, you like can put your foot over into the Ew. other stall and give a little like Morse code of like come on Bone over me? here. Yeah. <laughs> Paper bag. Just go get a hotel. But it's boys a, are gross. No, because they like that public display, you know? Because they're boys and they're All just right. horny. So one other disturbing... Th- one, I found this image online and it's just like... I can't get it out of my head. It's the cop car that... The cop was the security car, but it okay. looks like a cop car. The actual car that Edwin was driving. And in the back window is her missing poster. And it's just so sad and depressing. Oh, my God. Yeah. Like, literally, she had, what, 12 hours, 20 hours before that been laying in that same yeah, spot? I know. It's very sad. But I, I mean, luckily, this oh, gross. this was handled very quickly. It was only, yeah. what, three days, and they solved it. And Well, you have to imagine, if he hadn't gone off the rails... We would probably never what know. Would, like, well, would they would have thought, found her, but yeah. Yeah, you would have thought, okay, she got hit. Okay, now we're looking for her on campus. And then days later or however yeah. long. like It was pretty obvious when they found her body, though, that she was not a car crash. because Right, but I mean. The the detectives told the parents not even to go to the morgue to oh, identify I'm sure her. sure not. She was just. I'm sure not. Unrecognizable. But, you know, how long would that have taken to have found? Like, yeah. you almost have to appreciate that he did what he did Lost because it. yeah otherwise they would have still been suffering i'm just and... happy that andrea didn't find herself in a similar position right that, and you know maybe that's due to her and the things she chose to do mm-hmm. oh actually i have to tell you this part i didn't put it in in the case but one of my favorite things that she describes happening is before they get to the super eight and try to get that guy's car i think they tried to rent a room to get some sleep. So mm-hmm. Edwin takes a shower and he tries to force Andrea in the shower and she refuses. She's like, I would rather die than be naked and showering in front of you. Mm-hmm. And so he gives in and handcuffs her to the bed, but makes her take a sleeping pill. So she is like, I'm about to be raped. My life is over. And like an intervention, her alarm on her phone goes off and she doesn't have any recollection recollection of setting this late night alarm. Right. Mm. And he goes, what's the alarm for? And she just on her feet goes medication. And he goes, well, what for? And she says for an STD trying to hope that like, Oh my God, that's so brilliant. It's genius, right? Like I, if I have HIV or something, oh, you're right. not going to want to rape me. Right. 
it's so good and so then so smart right and then it buys a little bit of time and he ends up getting a message from a family member saying the cops are on the lookout for you so then they leave so i mean she basically you know forged her own destiny there like it was i thought that was bad stash that one away she's only 19 yeah like that was quick thinking i think that was pretty awesome wow that's impressive yeah i really would like to meet her she sounds pretty cool yeah well i'm glad that good things have come from Kaylee's loss yeah you know that's it's a horrible thing to lose someone that young and god is she beautiful both girls are beautiful and it's so interesting because one is fair and one is dark but they just somehow kind of look alike Mm, and it makes you wonder if that's why he chose Andrea right um but yeah I'm so happy that nothing happened to her because what a loss with with Kaylee and is there um is there a website or at least a Facebook or something for the KK's book uh, you know, I haven't found that yet, but there is a Remembering Kaylee Sawyer group on Facebook okay. that you can go to and they will definitely post how you can help with the with donations, with spreading the word, what have you. Cool. Well, at least some good came from it. Definitely. The smell of pine saw was like orgasm inducing when i would always volunteer to mop the floor i worked at this hair salon on the weekends i would volunteer to mop because i just want to smell it and i could like imagine drinking (laughs) okay we're good julie proceeded to recruit friends and family to help search for kaylee and started posting it's over (laughs) (laughs) that seems a little dramatic i know I need to take that one again. That sounded like fucking shit. (laughs) (laughs) Police are looking for the vehicle and now they know. Wait, what? (laughs) Sorry. Sorry. Nope. You lost privileges. Good one, Henry. Good fucking job. What's going on? He was bumping the goddamn dog. Henry. No. This is not the way to my heart, Henry. (laughs) <laughs> oh it's 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 tough because i no i love it but it's also very annoying <laughs> <laughs> that's called love after i was transported 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 <laughs> he lives out the remainder of his sentences in the snake river connect connectional institution <laughs> How is you think you're going to hear him in the background? No, I think, oh my God, his tongue is hanging out. His tongue is hanging out. Come over here. Murder in the Rain is produced and edited by Josh McCullough. Written and hosted by Emily Rowney and Alicia Holland. Artwork by Jamie Costa. Music by Kai Pfeiffer at kyfifer.com. Check out our website, murderintherain.com, for additional information on all cases, a fun interactive map, and be sure to subscribe so you can receive our newsletter. Check out the Mad Props page for coupon codes from some of our sponsors. We love your reviews and seeing them on all streaming platforms, especially iTunes. And check us out on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. And suck my balls. (laughs) Please put that in. (laughs) 